Hey guys, we are back. The Impossible Podcast is back and here to stay. Uh, we'll be coming at you live every Thursday with a new podcast interviewing impossible people doing impossible things, helping you to push your limits and do something impossible. Today's guest is Ed Latmore of edlatmore.com. He's a professional boxer, a physicist, and he's really, really good at Twitter. He's basically the Confucius of Twitter. He's got he's gotten really, really good at distilling awesome little tidbits of wisdom into 140 characters. And if you're not following him already, you should be. Uh, in today's episode, we talk about mental toughness, his career as a boxer, his journey of how he's come up at Twitter, plus how black does he like his coffee. So I'm going to get out of the way. It's good to be back. I hope you guys enjoy this episode and let's get into it. All right, and we're live. A couple difficulties, but we're here. Thanks for uh, coming on the show today. Hey, thank you for having me, man. We we really did have some technical difficulties. You guys should have heard it. It was like there were, there were two of me, well, more like one and a half, the way it was linking up. But now everything sounds clear, I hope. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a tough, uh, that's a tough interview, two, uh, two on one. So if you guys don't know who Ed is, um, Ed... Maybe you can give them a little bit of your background, but I first came across Ed as uh, I think I think you're before I found you, you were the most r- random person I didn't follow that was retweeted in my Twitter feed. Um, somehow everybody everybody within my social circle uh, was finding your tweets and tweeting them out, and then I actually I told I just told you. Um, I, I followed you for a while, and then I had to unfollow you and move you to a private list because I was spending so much time um, just scrolling through your tweets and be like, "Man, that's good. That's good. That's good. Retweet that one." Um, and so, um, yeah. So I just give just give people a little bit of your background, and then we can talk um, a little bit more about um, you know how 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 all that came to be. Um. Yeah. So. So, like you said, I box. Uh, p- professional heavyweight boxer. A record of thirteen and one, and one. But no one ever counts the draw. They just kind of ignore that when it comes time to market fights and make them. Unless, the, even unless the draw was like some high level thing you can use to market. But for, the, for effectively thirteen and one, and okay. and I'm in school right now. I'm, I'm in my. Uh, what did we end? We had this semester, and then this semester, and then I have two more classes. So not a full semester before I have a full-fledged undergraduate degree in physics. So there's that. And and I, I like to write a lot, and it just so happens that Twitter is an excellent medium that rewards, you know, verbal acumen if you can translate it into to writing. So I, I really have fun doing that. People seem to get a lot out of it, and it really helps me clarify and sharpen my thoughts about many things. I mean, I, I tweet about so many different subjects that <laughs> that it's hard to say, you know, some people like to classify me as a, as a self-improvement account, but it, it depends on when you when you follow me. Sometimes I'm tweeting about black coffee. Other times I'm tweeting about physics. I mean, it just it just depends. But it all it all comes back to using the medium effectively to propagate ideas and propagate ideas to, you know, before they changed it to this 280 characters, which I think is a mistake because 140 characters forced efficiency. And whenever you have efficiency and economy in anything, you tend to get a much better result than had you had ac- excess resources, you know? So that, that, th- yeah. that's who I am in, in a nutshell without diving too deep into how we got there or why we got there. Well, it's, um, the the i think the section um of your twitter feed that i ran across and really started to resonate with me because um uh what's interesting to me is we we have pretty different backgrounds uh but a lot of the things that uh, i talk about i found like in your twitter feed and you had distilled them in a in a better way some ways um you know than i uh i i had thought about or said it in a different way um 
And that's what really drew me. And I was going through your book as uh, oh, we were getting man. ready for the podcast. <laughs> and and like a bunch of the opening paragraphs kind of like put me on my butt. I mean, they're the things that I'm always interested in is, in is when you run into people uh, with different backgrounds from you, you know, I've never boxed a day of my life. I've thought about actually getting into fighting a little bit more um, just because I think it's, you know, it's, it's a useful thing, but I've never actually done it. I always played like basketball and, um, you know, all these ball sports. And um, when I got back down to, you know, your book, it opens with, you know, like self-discipline <laughs> it, it all starts with self-discipline. Um, and those are the same concepts that I talk about on a regular basis, except it's with, you know, running ultra marathons and, and doing stuff like that. So um, why, like, where did, um, as you're, you know, you, you describe yourself kind of as like a pseudo, not a pseudo, but um, like part-time philosopher, <laughs> um, where, where did like those angles, when you start writing, where did that show up? Um, where did that, uh, you, you, are you just writing what's on your mind or how do you kind of get the inspiration for, um, you know, you're just sitting down and you say, I'm going to tweet oh. this one day. And, uh, well, yeah, you know, where uh, it comes from for me is life, right? I've been, for better or worse, in a position where I've lived quite a different ways or I've, I've lived in many different ways. And the and each each way I've lived, I've learned from and I tried to use to get to a better version of myself, a better life for myself. And it it works this way because it or, or rather the reason why it works is because I try to sit and distill something from each thing that happens in my life. And when you when you do that, you're forced to look at things objectively. Otherwise, you can't you can't get the best possible lesson from it. Sure, there are things you felt, but if you only focus on how you feel, you will ultimately miss a lot of good things because because the things that feel the worst are usually the ones that teach you the most. So I like to sit and reflect on that. And when I'm reflecting, it really is natural for me to do it with words or more specifically to do it externally, not to just keep it in my mind and mull over an idea, but to write it down to speak about it, to put these things together. And then I know it's a good idea. I know it is. I know I've captured the essence of what I've experienced. If I can put it into a format to where other people can get something from it, it's, it doesn't matter if I get something from it. I've already experienced life, but it, it's like one of the, the de facto models of my blog is it's I've, I've, I do things. Uh, I, I break down but I've learned the hard way so you can learn it the easy way without having to go through like growing up in a project or getting beat on TV or being dirt poor and being an alcoholic, man, like all of these things. Right. Uh, and those are just, those are the negative things. I mean, there's positives too. Like, you know, I'm sitting, you know, in my, in my apartment with, with my wonderful girlfriend and, and that they're meeting her. And that's an experience too. And I, I draw from all of these things and I try to take those lessons and, and distill them and give them to other people. Cause I think, I think, uh, what good is your life if you don't use what you've gone through to try and help someone else kind of avoid the big potholes, the, the con where you hit and you don't just go through a bump, but you, your, your vehicle is completely out of commission and you're stuck. And so that's, that's where I, that's my motivation and my heart to try and give people that information. But mentally I'm just distilling what I've experienced. There's uh have you, have you read man's search for meaning by Victor? I Frankl? have, you know, that book was on my, <laughs> all, what is, what are we at? It's the year 2017. That book was on my bedside for like all of 20, for at least the, the second half of 2016, especially after I lost on TV, because it's so interesting to read that that tale of you know being in the concentration camps and what they had to go through and you realize man my life is just not that bad like no matter what no matter what you're going through you were not like you weren't in the holocaust i mean if you know if you happen to be that old and you're listening obviously you know hats off to you but most of us haven't been in anything close to that and so that to keep that kind of thing in perspective, I think stories like a man search mini really helps people get to the next level of giving of, of seeing life through a lens of gratitude. 
because maybe they've never dealt with any real hardship and it's all relative. But when they see just how bad it could really be from someone else's eyes, <laughs> then they're like, wow, holy shit, man. This yeah. guy, I, I, there was like a story in there I read, I remember, where he, he, I think they made a march and dig for like 12 miles in the cold and they were already starving. And I'm like, man, not only did you do it, but you survived and you were able to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. The uh, so so real quick for people who don't know uh, what the book is about, it's basically Victor Frankl is a psychologist in uh, the Holocaust, and he basically documents um, why people <laughs> why people uh, why some of the people survived and why some of the people didn't. And one of the uh, overarching themes is that people who survived were able to find redemption in the suffering. Um, and when you're saying uh, what you're saying about, you know, all these bad things that, you know, all these things that you had to go through um, and then you're kind of distilling the lesson down, um, you're finding that little piece of what, you know, OK, that maybe that w- was hell at the time. But as you came out through the other side, uh, you know, what what can you get out of that and how do you move forward? Because if you just uh, lament what happened uh you never actually make any forward progress. Right. And, and more important and not more importantly, but, but I guess a corollary to that is that to be able to take these lessons, right? Obviously when you are in the moment of things being unbelievably difficult, it's very difficult. It's very hard for you to look back and say, or or to distance yourself from yourself and go, you know what? You're going to have some lessons from this. Just, just get through it. No, right. At that at that moment, you're like, yeah. "Holy shit, man! This is terrible, and I need to get through it." However, after some time, after you go through enough difficulty, you kind of gain the ability to to do that. You do, and and you can look back and go, "Wow, you know, I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to what? What do they say? They say, well, you know, one day you're going to look back at this and laugh." Well, people don't realize that that is not an innate thing like and most people are not in the middle of the hardship going man i'm gonna look back at this time when i'm trying to decide between rent and food and laugh like no (laughs) right then you're like man i gotta figure out what i'm gonna do or maybe i'm gonna have to do some some awful things to to make sure i make it through this month but (laughs) when you're constantly thinking this when you're always thinking how am i going to learn as you get better at seeing how a thing is going to teach you a thing you get better at making steps to to kind of facilitate that learning right if, if i'm a person who doesn't believe i'll get anything from my experiences then why would i ever try and improve from them why would i ever try and learn i'll be stuck right there but if i'm always sitting there thinking going okay this is bad right now but one day i'm going to be able to write about this and give it back to someone so they can avoid it then I'm going to be much more motivated to get through it and figure out a way. And not only that, but get through it in a way that's going to motivate a person. Yeah. The, uh, one of the, one of the things that motivated me to start, uh, so my background, um, I think you've read a little bit about it, but you know, I like six or seven years ago, I was living in my parents' basement, um, like being a UPS driver and just being really depressed with my life. And, and basically couldn't get hired by Starbucks. And oh man, they hire everybody. <laughs> and I, was just, <laughs> I know. I, like, I, really Starbucks? Yeah. I can't, I can't, I can't make some coffee really. Yeah. Um, but, uh, basically what, what kind of jump started me to actually start trying things was, uh, reading, um, reading a book that challenged me to like, think about my life as a story and see, like, do what a, a good character in a story would do. And so that's been interesting and, and writing about uh, the different things as I do them on my impossible list, as I go after them uh, actually has kind of changed the, the act of doing the thing because I'll be in the middle of a race. I'll be, you know, 40 miles into a race. And I'm like, I don't want to go any farther. And, (laughs) and, and it's like, you know, it's, it's 110 degrees outside. Like I'm, have no more uh water in me at all like i'm completely drenched and uh sometimes i'm like you know what this sucks i'm pissed this is horrible nothing good is going to come out of this but at least i'm going to get a good story and like right. sometimes i'm like you know what that's <laughs> that's the that might not be the best reason but it's a reason and no, um, I, I it's one of that. of those things that if you can <laughs> 
if you can if you can remove yourself it it it's sort of it's sort of you make a deal with your future self and you're like listen this is going to suck right now for you but in the future like you're going to get something out of it and um i find a lot of those things like you know oh building character or you know building resiliency like that's not really that interesting in the middle of the race but you're if you can figure out like okay how can i how can i find anything in the situation to drag me forward um that's super helpful in just actually getting through the thing that you need to get through absolutely i always I always say right i remember when i was 28 and i decided okay it's time to go back to school right and that's i mean the older you get the harder it becomes to make that decision but i said okay you know i'm gonna be you know i'll be 33 on my next birthday in february I said, okay, I'm going to be 33 regardless. What am I going to do? Am I going to become 33 <laughs> with some options or am I going to be 33 trying to figure out? At that point in time, I think I was working at, I was working at T-Mobile. I was like, am I going to become you know, a, one of those boxers who has nothing but my boxing and hope, hope, hope that I'm looking for jobs at like T-Mobile or working at night somewhere mm -hmm. doing like shift work, which I, you know, which, you know, more power to you if that's all you, if, if you're out there doing it and, and you're crushing it, but that wasn't for me. So what I, what I like to imagine sometimes though, on, on top of that future projection and using Tom that, and then using Tom in this way, as I like to go, okay, I imagine I'm sitting at dinner and I'm the most interesting person at the dinner table. How can I get there? Right. You get there by having stories. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember that was like the whole campaign. I wrote this thing about it. I don't, I don't remember why, why, why I did it or what I was looking up, but I was researching the Dos Equis most interesting man in the world campaign. <laughs> the original one. I don't like the new one, yeah. but the original one and you know, their sales skyrocketed. I mean, we're like, we're talking like 50, I think, I think there was 500% I read and, and then you get it because they paint the picture like, like good advertising, right? If you drink this beer, you'll be this guy. Well, what's so appealing about this guy? Well, he's done a lot of things, a lot of different things and a lot of hard things, and he's survived, and he's got stories now. And everyone, everyone wants to be around someone who has that kind of interesting background, you know? And and if you continue to push yourself through things and you continue to learn and you might not be the best at them, but you're doing the thing that most people in the pot, like, like you, I was reading your accomplishment list just in general, doing some research and you're one of seven people to complete an ultra marathon on, on all seven continents, right? Come on, man. That is like, you can't even put that number into a calculator, like seven over seven million, you're going to get effectively zero. So, so at any dinner table you go to, right. And using this in my, my little imagine, imagination exercise, yeah. you're going to be one of, if not the most interesting uh, people that, that everyone there has met. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, that's true. Um, no, I think, I think the, I think coming back to the stories is, is the thing that is consistently is a underutilized driver that people don't necessarily think about. But once you figure it out, um, you, you're able to sort of detach yourself a little bit. I was, um, I remember specifically there was a race I was in Finland and I was like 30 K in the race. And basically this race was unsupported and there was no water anywhere. And, um, so I started eating snow, like, because I was, <laughs> I, I ran out of like, so I had a water thing at the beginning. It busted five minutes before the race. And so I grabbed a water bottle. I drank that like 10 K in. And so 10 K after that, I was, I basically had no water. So I'm eating snow in the middle of the race. Uh, I get to 30 K and there's a campfire and the the check-in instead of having a timing match or something like that it's just someone with a uh like a, a like a notebook and they're like okay you have to sign your name whatever and um and they had a fire and they had a pot and so i was like i need water there's no water on this course except for the snow my <laughs> my bag is like exploded and but there's a pan. So I'm like, can I steal that pan? And so they had a bonfire or whatever. So I took a bunch of snow, threw it in the pan, 
And I, I literally sat down in the middle of the race for about 10 minutes and just melted snow into water and then poured the water into like <laughs> my water bottle. And I was, all I was thinking, there's, there's two aspects of the, um, the situation. I was like, I can't believe like, you know, I'm, I'm losing time. Uh, this is, you know, I, I don't have any water. Like this is pissing me off. I'm completely dehydrated. And then part of it, I was just like, I just had to sit back. I'm like, this is going to make a story. This is going to make a good story because <laughs> like you could, you could, you couldn't make this up if you wanted to. So, um, no. no. So I think, I think that's really like key. If you can maintain that focus, um, uh, you know, maybe there's like one redeeming factor when you're in the mid- midst of all this crap. Uh, there's always, you know, one little thing that can maybe pull you through. And if uh, thinking about it as like a future self looking back on you now, how would you want that character to act and then doing whatever you'd like them to do? And I'm curious how um, how rare, how common are completely unsupported races? So it depends. Um, it's ultras are kind of their own beast, and so there are some. So, so, so there was a longer race. I think it was like a three day race where these guys are basically um, in Finland. They have these sleds they pull behind them called pulkas, um, and they basically, um, if you're walking or if you're cross country skiing, you have this uh, rope tied to like your waist or your shoulder, and then you have like a sled of all gear. Um, and food and stuff. So you have like three days worth of stuff with you. Um, the problem was we're doing a, ours was a 66 K race. So there's like 66 K, um, which is like 40 some miles or whatever. And then there is 150 K and there's a 300 K, but those were, those were fat bike. And those were, uh, cross country skiing. So you have guys on like cross country skis doing that. So, um, I haven't run into, I think that was the first unsupported, completely unsupported race uh, I've done. Usually, most races have something, but you know, this was basically you run out in the back country, and <laughs> I was all set. Like I had my camel back. I had I had I had enough water beforehand um, to do the whole race. I was like well prepared, and then five minutes before the race, my my water bladder like literally just exploded, uh, completely busted, and then I had to go. You know, it's like. All right, too close for missiles. I'm switching a gun, so I had to switch to uh, <laughs> like a water bottle. And I'm like, I knew going out. I'm like, this is not going to be enough. Um, but I, I was a little bit more uh, hopeful <laughs> that I could uh, melt snow on the go. And I just realized I couldn't do that until I like sat down in front of a fire. So, um, yeah, that was my <laughs> that was my water situation. And then and then all that water that I had uh, melted down. Uh, froze a mile and a half later after I left the camp. So I was like, all right, this place is just never like, it's got it in for me and I have to, I have to deal with it. Um, but going, so you've, you've talked a couple times uh, a little bit about your background, but I don't know if we went into your background at all. Um, and some of the stories. And um, I, I feel like for the people that are already familiar with you, you know, with the tweets and the blog and the book, uh, they probably have a pretty good idea, but um can you talk a little bit about like your background before boxing and like why you got into boxing um, and just some of the, <laughs> the details there that people might not know about? Uh, yeah, sure, man. It's, it's a, it's one of my favorite stories. One of those formative year stories, I guess. <clears throat> but, but yeah, so I, I didn't start boxing until I was 22. And before that I hadn't really done, I, I like played football in high school. And I played a year of football at, at a small Division three college, but I would I never thought seriously I'm going to box. But I had spent the years between like 19 and 22, pretty much doing nothing. And I I was dating this girl, and I made sure I revolved my entire life around making sure I could see her every day. And when you do something that stupid, you. you you don't develop yourself at all. I mean, I live like there's just three years. Like at the very least, like when I talk about wasted time of my life, I can I can honestly say that although I speak negatively about my mid and early twenties, at least at that point, I, I I was at least boxing and developing that skill. 
But but the year nineteen to twenty two, goodness, man, what a just a waste, right? There's there's nothing. I mean, I, that part of my life could vanish, and nothing today would change. Like now, granted, like that that's an exaggeration, you know, butterfly effect and all that. But what I mean is that there's nothing that was going on then. That there was even a a a slight slight result from today. But with that said, you know, when I when I when I got dumped miserably, I was like, let me go do something to make my life worthwhile because I used to have these arguments with our mom about the the value of higher ed and one day she said, Well and remember her her mom's a professor at a university, so that's automatically a natural I'm I'm a natural antagonist with that perspective. <laughs> so so she said to me one day, she goes, you know, what have you done for four years? Even if you sat in a monastery somewhere on a mountain, uh, you would have had four years invested somewhere. And that really that really bugged me. I mean, she said that right before she threw me out of her house again that day. You know, I, I, I started getting thrown out quite a bit. But but that stuck with me. I was like, man, you know what? I really need to do something. I really need to put my four years in somewhere, right? And I, I wasn't I wasn't ready to go to college. So I was like, you know what? I'm curious about boxing. I think I had been watching YouTube videos. That was like right when YouTube started. So I went and found a gym. Well, it wasn't it wasn't that quick. At first, I had to get a car to get to the gym, and it turns out the, the gym was <laughs> on the bus line anyway. And you know, this is also related. Someone I always yeah. find different parts of the story whenever I tell it that I remember. This is also related to me learning to drive a stick shift because the first, the car I got that was initially taking me to the gym was a stick shift. And my friend who was selling it to me wouldn't sell it to me unless I could start <laughs> on a hill. So, and it was a great deal. I mean, it was a $400 car that was not in bad shape. It lasted me. So, so yeah, uh, that's how I got into the gym. <laughs> is that I needed to do something. And I thought the best option was like, let me go do boxing. That's cool. People like me if I box, you know, <laughs> stupid. That, that, that motivation evaporated eventually. That's not why I box at all. I don't care, you know, what people think of me now. As, as long as they don't think I'm like some child molester or something crazy like that. But, <laughs> but for the most part, yeah, that's how I got into the gym. And I really, I'm really happy because going to the gym – started a small but but now it's gained momentum after 10 years change in who i am and has really made me a way better person funny you hear that yeah. you know, punching people makes you better but it has it's it's taught me a lot about discipline it's taught me a lot about pain it's taught me a lot about uh it's taught me a lot about luck uh, I, but that's a whole set of stories in and of itself you know, they say luck is opportunity meets preparation. And I'll tell you what, man, there are a lot of there are a lot, a lot of my breaks. I've had, I've had a better than average career for someone who's gotten who got started at my age. And a lot of it was just making the right unemotional decisions and putting myself in a position to where my preparation would influence the outcome or uh, in my future, even though I didn't know how or I didn't have control of the out of the, of the eventual uh, intersection between the opportunity and my preparation so yeah so with with boxing i was going to ask you about this um you kind of went from a place where you're kind of float it seems like you're a little floating you hadn't really committed to doing anything not doing school uh you know just kind of meandering a little bit um you start boxing because you know, you you want people to like you or whatever it is. I, I imagine that goes away pretty soon as as soon as you get punched in the uh, face. Um, <laughs> yep. And 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 then what what was the thing that like, made you stick with boxing? Because I can imagine like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do boxing or whatever. And it, unlike you know basketball or something, where you're like, oh, I'm just not a good shot. I'm really short. Like maybe something you know, like maybe I'm just not good at this. Like boxing is like, oh, I got punched in the face really quickly and that hurt. I don't want to go back there. Uh, but something about that situation obviously pulled you in and you've been doing it for what? 10 yeah. Years now? Yeah. And, and then I plan to come back uh, right. Cause right now I'm in a, 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 almost done with the year off period. And then I'll be back training full time. I already started my, my running routine and goodness, man, cardio is, is a beast. You know, <laughs> I don't have what, to tell what you. What did you, you you put out something this morning about it? You said cardio is yeah, like cardio uh, is 
You know, uh, I don't, and people who disagree, I don't think they understand what I'm talking about or they've experienced, like, I don't think they've experienced having the the cardiovascular output of a boxer and then going to a normal person and then trying to get it back. It, it It's painful, but it is definitely easier to, to get back than losing strength. It's not even a question, but it also fades way faster than strength. Yeah. You mean like you set yourself up lifting? I mean, let, to put this in perspective, I, at the height of my training for football, I think I was benching like three seventy five. I have not put myself through a heavy lifting program like that since in over ten years, and I can still get on a bench and throw up three fifteen cold. I mean, it's just not it's not comparable. But I but, but my peak running conditioning, like when I'm when I'm getting ready <laughs> for a fight, I can I can mow down four miles in twenty eight minutes. There's that's not. That that is not a weak pace whatsoever. I cannot do that cold. I I can't just walk out. You know, I, if I stop running for for a month, I can't do that. That that is consistent yeah. training. But um, yeah. What was the, the original question? I know it wasn't related. No, I'm 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 sympathizing over here because uh, I know I know exactly what you mean. Um, oh, what the, kept, the original what question kept was, me in? What kept me in? Yeah. What what kept you in? Because as soon as you get punched in the face. Uh, was it Tyson had yeah, that quote? Has Everybody has a plan until you get face. Yeah, so so this, yep. the, what kept me in is I I never really had a plan to leave and and when I say that like yeah if I if I went out there and got like Molly Watt my first like five fights I'd be like huh this probably isn't worth it but mm-hmm. I had early success and my natural attitude towards towards things which is okay I'm not going to leave. I'm going to have to get beat out of this or make a mistake out of this. Those two things combine the early success, the continued success, right? I also really enjoyed the learning part of it. People don't, people, a lot of people don't understand what it's like to learn to use your body in this way, because what what it comes down to in the end is control. Control is, is a, it's a function of ability, right? It's a function of strength. It's a function of agility. All of these things, getting my neuro, my, my, um, my neuromuscular system, I believe that is the right combination, to work in tandem and to execute when I wanted to execute, to push through being hurt, to push through pain, to feel fear, to confront your emotions, all of these things. I really enjoy the self-development aspect of boxing. So that naturally kept me in because I could see how I was developing, how I was improving, not just physically, which is the obvious part, but mentally and emotionally. I could see um how every how people's perception of me changed as I changed. And that was really important. I mean it was obviously quite a bit of work to do in the person I was compared to the person I am today and even the person I'll be in ten years. But one of the things that kept me is I greatly enjoy seeing the the progress I was making. I mean, you can really get addicted to progress. It's awesome. And I just, I don't understand just like quitting a thing. That's not, that's not me. I mean, I, I, to to put that in perspective, like this semester, uh, I took on four, 400 level physics classes and that's a dumb thing to do, you know, but no one told me that was dumb. (laughs) They just caught like my advisor knows my personality and she just went along with it. She didn't, she didn't raise an eyebrow. She just helped me out. And then when I realized I was in over my head, I went and told her, she said, you know, I thought that was a bad idea. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me? She was like, well, you know, I know you would do it anyway. And and you had to figure out for yourself. And I just want to help people with their goals. And I'm like, great. But, but yeah, like, I don't consider that quitting. It's not like I dropped out of school. I, I, I encountered a limit. And that's the only did way. you so so what'd you do with it? Did you did you drop I a class or did classes, you uh, okay. and now I'll be there for one more semester. The original goal was to graduate this semester because I had four that was that was my only requirement left, four four physics classes of a four hundred level or higher. And and so now I just dropped two and I'll be back next semester. But I'll tell you what, the the whole idea of quitting is just not it's not part of me. I don't really 
understand how people can put, especially after you've invested some sweat equity. We're not even talking about people, you know, where where I can at least make the stretch mentally and imagine, okay, you had a, you had a, you fell off the horse. You don't want to get back on it. Right. I don't agree with it, but I can understand that. But if you're a great rider and you fall off the horse or you've even like ridden a few times, you fall off and then you're like, Oh, that's it. One little mess up. I'm done. No, I don't get that. Uh, so yeah, that that's pretty much what kept me in boxing. Those two attitudes or those two feelings: the improvement and the no quit. And the 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 interesting piece that you said you kind of glossed over it a little bit. Um, you said something like you didn't drop out, um, and I think that's super important. That maybe a lot of people don't um, they don't always pick up is just because you have to change the plan doesn't mean you have to. To give right. up entirely because there's people that be like, you know, ah, this this semester sucks. I'm done. I'm leaving. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. And you're like, whoa, that was a bad decision. <laughs> it's probably probably overkill. Uh, <laughs> might not have known that if if I didn't just jump into it. And now that I do, you know, gonna do another semester and it's going to take another, yeah. you know, a little more no, time. You got to find your limits. And the only way people talk about limits and all that, like, look. And you know, because I was just reading your blog today, man, you you know this. So you can kind of take this and even put it in your own words different from me. You don't know what your limits really are until you push past them. You can't approach them and know. It doesn't work that way. You have to go past them and get defeated or, or get severely hindered and go, okay, this is where my breaking point is. If you, but because every point beforehand, especially if you have the, the type of personality that I have, every point beforehand, you'll just keep pushing. I mean, you, there's no way. Why wouldn't you? You go, okay, I did this. I'll just do this. I'll do a little more. I'll do a little more. You know, because we we see the world linearly as people. So we think, okay, this worked. So I got this. Let me do more of this. I'll get more of that. Ah, not so much. There is definitely a point. It is more like a curve where you reach the top and everything after that you pay for with diminished performance and results. Mm -hmm. The, um, there's something, there's something too, where you have to be willing to, um, have like experience that pain experience that failure experience that overwhelm um in order to get stronger you know it's like lifting weights is your muscles are actually breaking themselves down uh and then you build up stronger and i think a lot of people try to insulate themselves from ever actually experiencing like pain or difficulty and that buffer that they give themselves to avoid pain is you know uh, a good, a good section inside what their actual limits are. And so if they're not willing to go beyond the pain, um, they're not going to be able to do more than, um, what they've done before. Um, and, and I'm really curious cause you're, you're talking a lot again, you know, this is the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you cause we have different backgrounds, uh, different sports, but there's a physicality, there's a physicality to boxing that you have to experience that is i think i think there's something to the fact that most people don't they're not really familiar with their bodies um they don't i, I don't know if that sounds no, weird no, but like I, people I don't know you. i i want to see where you go with this but I, I definitely agree with the general statement that you made yeah so people don't people don't know what actual pain is they 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 think Okay, I worked out really hard yesterday. Now I'm sore. Like that's pain. Like that's not pain. Like that's 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 you're sore. discomfort. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're you're uncomfortable. And and there's this idea that people have sort of um, they're not in their bodies all the time, and they then they get stuck in their heads. And they're instead of doing things with their body in life, they're stuck in their head, and then they get stuck in circles. Um, and I've seen this quite a bit with people where they they have entire arguments in their head, um, and they all make perfect sense. And then if you ask them to write it out, or if you ask them to speak it out loud, uh, because that's using their body, they they run into problems. Or if you ask ask them to actually just do the thing or try the thing that you're thinking about all the time, they run into issues because 
there's like an unfamiliarity with their body. And there's something about ultra marathons where you get to the point in every single race. It doesn't matter how good of a runner you are. Like I mean, maybe some of the really good guys, I'm not, I'm not that good. I'm, I, I, I can outlast people with pain, but I'm not super fast. So, um, maybe there's some guys out there that just, you know, they never feel pain. They're, they're cruising for all hundred miles, whatever. Um, for me, I know every race <laughs> there's going to be a point where I'm just like, man, I want to go home right now. I am like, this hurts. I do not want to be here. And, um, and then I like, that's the reason I run the race because I get to that point and that's the race for me. That that's the decision where I have the opportunity to be like, okay, well, I'm just gonna, you know, knock off at the next aid station and go home. <laughs> or, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna push through this and I I might be super slow the whole time. Like I like I've I've had races where I'm like, I don't know if I like I'm aiming to hit the cutoff right now. I'm it's gonna be close, but I am not gonna not like I'm not going to not finish this thing. And like, there's a, like, I don't, I don't know if it's like in your gut or your soul or wherever it is, but there's just like with all the pain and all the, like, you know, I, I had, I had one race where that, that Finland race where I had no yeah. water. Um, I had bu busted my foot. Basically I was kind of like cobbling, um, on the way home, it was negative 16 degrees out. My water had frozen after I'd melted it. Like everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And, um, I just kind of like <laughs> did like some big, deep guttural <laughs> breaths that, uh, I just finished watching the Punisher and I'm, I, they're kind of like the breaths he was making when he was going crazy. But, um, you just like take these deep, big, deep guttural breaths. And then you just like, this is happening. And like, instead of, okay, you know, things are happening to me, you know, it's cold out that it's, it's specifically being cold to torture me. Uh, I kind of just accepted the reality and said, you know, like this race, you're not going to, you're not going to beat me. Yeah, there um, you go. You're, you're not, <laughs> you're not winning that. And I don't care if I have to crawl to the, the, the finish line, but I'm, I'm willing to do whatever I need to do. And I'm not going to get taken off this course. And when you do that, and then you come back to like normal life, uh, and people are like, you know what? I don't want to do that. Cause it's hard. <laughs> You're like, what? Um, you like, there's no perspective. And I imagine there's a similar physicality in boxing where, you get I, i'm not going to speak to it but i imagine you get punched a couple times and you're like man I, oh, i'm good i'm done sure, here right? you know I, like, I, i'm gonna go you home know, you said something earlier about about the running and the pain and how you anticipate the pain will exist every time right you know ne you never go into a race thinking okay this one's gonna feel great and there we no pain no i like and what i what i try and tell friends are like man i want to get into running but it just hurts i'm like you gotta understand something man i mean maybe i'm the weirdo maybe i'm wrong right but i tell them like, never ever ever have i run a, a good run that actually makes a difference in my my physiology and i haven't hurt you learn to deal with pain. You learn to push through it. It's, that's not going anywhere. Like it, it's, it, it's never going to be, Oh great. It's time to go run five miles. It's going to be like a massage. Like, you know, that's never going to happen. So instead you just <laughs> learn to push through pain and people are so apprehensive about uh, pain for lots of different reasons that they don't, they don't push themselves through things. So they don't know what it really feels like to suffer because when you, when you suffer though, like that, and I use suffering in the most general term when I say that. I don't mean like someone's torturing you. I mean sustained discomfort that is going to make most people submit to an outside force, right? Like you submit to your feeling uh, of of relaxation. You you want to give up. You, mm -hmm. you just go, oh, all right, that's it. I like, know that's not it's not going to help you get anything because life is. Life is not, if, if only life rewarded the easy way, right? That'd be awesome. But every single thing, I mean, sometimes the pain is physical, like when you're running on a track. Sometimes it's mental, like when you're going to stay up all day for the next four days studying for a physics final. And sometimes it's emotional, <laughs> like, man, I'm afraid of getting out of my comfort zone, but I really want to meet some people. No matter what. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, All worthwhile things have an element of pain that you have to push through. So it really is depressing when people complain about that aspect that like, oh, that's too hard. That's going to hurt. I feel like they don't understand that they're missing out on such a beautiful part of life because all the great things are on the other side of pain, man. There's just no, no way around it. And, and, and there's an actual, I don't know if this is me or if this is, I, I imagine it's a universal thing, but when you finish something really difficult and really painful and you're often still in the pain, like oh, right after sure. a race and I'm like, my knees can't move. Like, I like my everything is shot. Um, like there's, I don't, I don't know if it's a endorphins that kick in or, 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 you know what it is, but being under stress like that, there's something almost calming, uh, to your body physiologically where you're like, I don't, I don't know how to describe <laughs> it other than like my body knows that was good for me even though it was super painful. Yeah, you know, no one ever complains. I've never heard, man, I'm mad I went to the gym today. Man, that workout made me feel like shit. <laughs> like, I've never heard that. Just like, I've, I've, I've yeah. never heard someone make it through an exam and go, man, I'm mad I took that class this semester. If it was, like, something they wanted to do. You know, it, it, it never it it never works that way. We always imagine the worst part. Our minds immediately go to the worst thing. And that's horrible because the worst thing is like the worst thing is just the pain of doing it, right? And that's not even that bad. You know what? I'm going to be out of breath a little bit. I'm going to be sore. Oh, big deal, man, right? You know, Victor Frankel marched through the cold with 12 miles with no shoes on. I'm going to be a little cold. I'm going to be a little out of breath (laughs) running for five miles. Come on, man. It's it's not that serious. And you get a much greater reward. I mean, all Frankel got was his life. You're going to get some abs if you keep at it. That's a, that's a, that's a that's a tweetable. Um, one of the one of the one of the quotes I think I've seen you. I might be pinned on your Twitter. I saw it a long time ago, and it it stuck with me. Um, actually, when I was going through uh, some really rough uh, business legal stuff, was um, handle learn to handle a level of stress that would break oh, most yeah. people is that is that that's the correct right. that's quote? right and i have a section of my in my book from of where i took that from and or rather i had that you want that in the book however you want to look at a chicken egg you know <laughs> you took it yeah. from your own book plagiarizing <laughs> yourself um you can, you want to talk about that a little bit because i actually that that was like i don't know if you're talking about that physiologically but uh i was going through a point where um Mentally, I was under a ton of stress and um, I just realized I was like, man, this is like this is a lot like uh, it was a lawsuit and a bunch of other things that were going on. And I was just like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through. And then I I the way I have it in my mind is I I saw this quote and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to be a person that Uh, I'm going to be the one that makes it it through this because, you know, Um, that's what the whole Look at it evolutionarily, right? We we have these things, evolutionary stressors, uh, what are they called? Fitness indicators that, that, that show up after you survive, which pretty much demonstrate you've adapted. If you cannot adapt, you die, right? And stress is just mm-hmm. one of those things, man, one of those evolutionary pressures. If you can't make it through a thing, that thing is going to defeat you. Someone else who does make it through it, they're going to get the benefit. The benefit's the same. I mean, I, I like to, but, but just because that's where my mom, my space is right now for school. I, that's where the analogy comes from, but we can use it in, in, in anything, right? We're, we're going to go to college and we're going to make it through college and college is going to be, it's going to be stressful. Some people, they drop out. And those people, you know, if they drop out because the work was too hard, we're not talking about guys that drop out for business. Look, it's amazing how pedantic Twitter makes me. Like, <laughs> like I have to think about the 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 way, which is good. I mean, I guess it makes me a better communicator and better with rhetoric. But yeah, well, what I say is like, if you drop out of like school because you can't handle the workload, then what else can you not handle? I mean, college is easy. <laughs> And now you're going to give up a guaranteed minimum salary or or close enough to guarantee that you can get in this day and age, anyhow. And 
you know, you'll be behind. You won't get the the benefits that the other person could if they had stuck with the stress. It's the same working out. I mean, all these all these people you see on Instagram with these fitness accounts and everything. What is the difference between them and the average person? It's not what they're selling you. It's their their workout. They they stuck through the stress. They went to the gym. They got up and ran. They controlled their diet and avoided the sugars. Uh, okay, are you gonna go through that stress? Are you gonna buckle under it and go, man? You know what? I I really I really worked hard today. I'm gonna have me a few beers. I'm gonna slack off at the gym and watch some TV. And then next thing you know, it's like, well, it's the week and I should do that. And then then by the time Monday afternoon comes around, you know that's four days you wasted. And you're like, oh. and at that point, it's a habit. And so every everything that that is worthwhile has an element of stress, right? And if you could, and the greater the stress, generally speaking, the greater the reward will be. So mm-hmm. if you can learn to manage so, it, you get greater rewards. If you yeah. can make it through it, you can either make it through it or manage it. it, it and when I say manage it, you know, that's like delegation techniques, all these things to, to reduce the amount of individual stress that you, that you have to deal with. Or you just, you make it through it. I mean, some people are like, demons with this like when i hear some of these guys that sleep five hours all right look i i have i probably need slightly less sleep than average but i can i could never i mean when i do five hours of sleep i think i can do it for like three days before my brain can't absorb anything and i have to go to sleep and i start getting headaches but some people can do it i'm not one of them (laughs) but some people can some people can to handle that stress and and if there is a reward they get for that, great. They got it. My my game, I got to delegate it. But either way, we both have to manage that stress and make it through it. That stress that breaks most people. The uh, I I think I could do um, like two or three days of like less than seven hours of sleep. And I always think I'm being clever. I'm like, yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start at seven. Work my way down to six, and I'll be at five, and then I'm 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 gonna be super productive during the day. And no matter what, like my body always my if if I do that enough days in a row, then I'll just like sleep ten ten hours a day for like three or four days, and my body gets the sleep back. So um, I figured that's a sleep is actually a decent way to handle yeah, stress. So don't don't, don't um, skip on the sleep. Anybody listening, man, you can do it for for a little while, but you you got to manage. You just have to manage it better. I mean, I used to be. Whenever I, whenever I'm a night out, I know, I knew eventually, you know, you give it th- th- three to five days before I'm like clonked out, you know, I- I'll, I'll put in like the, the, some, some late nights, early mornings, three days in a row, about a fourth day, my girl's coming home. It's like the middle of the day and I'm asleep and it's like, okay, what happened? Well, you know, I have to make up that sleep. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm out for the day. To- this I wake my- up to eat, and then I go back to bed at like eight o'clock, and it. <laughs> That's funny. There, the um, I want to touch on one one other thing you said earlier. Um, you you said something about um, uh, but you were describing how people were talking. Uh, you know, the fitness accounts. Uh, some people are able to get through the stress. Some people say, you know, oh, I just got back to. But you know, hard day at work, and there seems to be a directionality on where people are focused. Like if people are. People that are doing stuff are always talking about like uh, they're like bargaining, bargaining with like their future selves. They're talking about like, hey, uh, I'm doing, you know, this course right now so that in a year I can graduate and do X, Y, Z. I'm going to the gym right now so I can, you know, get this fitness goal. And the people that uh, like your ability to handle stress is kind of depending on which direction you're looking at. And I'm just talking out of the top of my head, so I'm not sure if I'm going to articulate this correctly, but um, like the people that aren't able to handle it are always looking at like what they just did. Uh, like even in the example you said, you said I had a hard day at work. Um, things are really tough. I kind of deserve this beer or or what whatever their uh that specific example is. They're looking at the things that their past yeah. self did, and they're like, hey, <laughs> you know, I gotta I gotta reward him. Um, and they're not looking forward, bad. and then they basically take the the three days of the weekend to like reward yourself for being such a good, uh, you know, soldier, you know, during the weekday or whatever. And they completely forgetting about the future. And there's, I think there's a reason why the people that are looking kind of towards their, their future are progressing and people who are looking at the present or the past and 
you find out, you know, five years later, they're kind of still doing the same thing, kind of just, you know, kind of cruising along and, you know, they're, they're happy with it, but maybe they're not that happy with it. Maybe they're just dulled. Dude, that is it. the man. I've, I've done a, let me tell you something. I've probably at this point done, I mean, maybe at least 60. I mean, I've lost count uh podcast. And that is one of the most profound things if not the most profound thing that I've like heard on, on any, on any interview or our talk I've done that, that's, that's so spot on, man. Like, yeah, because at the, at the end of the day, right. When I'm, whenever I'm like able to, whenever I stick to like a low carb diet, because I'm thinking like, okay, I want to get a certain shape and body fat percentage and get ready for whatever. Right. And just get healthy. I'm not thinking about my old self except for how I can distance myself from those habits. <laughs> right? That's it. Yeah. People who cannot stick get, the, get that old photo of you <laughs> yeah. up on the on the wall. You're like, I'm getting as far away from that. Yeah, as people possible. who cannot make these changes in this regard are like, okay, let me look back at my old self and see what I can continue to be what I can carry how can I just kind of put my foot into the water of the, the the shallow end of the future pool instead of jumping all the way in and when they do that you know they they never get what they never go with the Todd man this is like solid stuff <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking about, about this now and my whole brain is like on fire with this analogy but yeah it, it, if you're always looking at how you can or what you've done and what that means to you and what you deserve for from it, you can't ever get to the future because you're always like you're by the by the purest definition of the word, you're playing catch up. You're always playing catch up. Mm -hmm. You're not proactively going after future. You're reacting to what you've done in the past, which means you're you, you're a slave to it. You can't you can't leave behind your old habits. And, and and even when you're moving forward, you're still like, you're still just backfilling. You're like, okay, well, this is for last week. Like, you, why not do something now that like, like pre-fills your, yourself for, for the next week coming up. So you don't have to like, feel like you're in this hole that you have to, uh, right. you know, fill and, up and really, the week really because. feel, I mean, I think this is all about, it's like why, how saving works with money. For example, if you, when you have a little bit of access to save, you save it. And you can think about the future, what you're trying to get done with it. Or you can go, man, you know, I put away this hundred bucks. I had a pretty good week. Let me go out and party with it. Like, <laughs> like, okay, cool. Now all you've done is set yourself back to the person you were before you had that hundred bucks, you know? <laughs> so it, it's a, it's a, man, that is like real. Never, I've never thought of it like that before. The whole where your direction is based on, or, or where your vision is. What you're looking at? Are you looking towards your future self and planning for that, making decisions based on that? Or are you making decisions based on a way that will facilitate your old self? That will because a lot of people think they can bring in who they were to the future, right? It's like, oh man, I'm not going to bring in 2017's old habits in the 2018. Like, okay, that's cool, but you got to be a completely different person than you were in 2017, and most people aren't ready to do that. I think about this when I, when I, every time I've, I, when I think about my sobriety, I go, okay, it was, very, people go, man, how could you give a booze on December 23rd? And I'm like, because I was tired of who I was on December 22nd, right? That person is gone. And now this new person has to come in and he cannot carry anything from the old God. The minute I start thinking I can be the old God is the minute the old God's habits show up. And now I'm going to go back to being that dude. It'd be all the, I'm coming up on four years, four years be waste. It'd be like, Oh, okay. Gone. Boom. Poof. Back to who I was like, no, I can never be the old person. You gotta, you gotta make some concession. You gotta make some change. People don't want to change because it's painful. We're coming back full, back full circle to the pain, right? It's pain, painful to change. Yep. At the very least, it is very, it is uncomfortable to change. And and the interesting thing about that, and maybe we wind down after that, but the 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 twenty third, like someone, I could. You know, people people say that all the time. Oh, I'm gonna wait till after the holidays to like change our meeting and all this other stuff. And you're like, you're like arbitrary days with like arbitrary like outside prescribed amounts of food or types of food or 
uh, you know, amount of alcohol that you're like supposed to be drinking. Like, like all those are more important than the thing that you say that you want to become or the things that you say you want to do. And people, <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, I'm going to start that beginning of the month. Like, well, what? Like today, today works. Today's today, today's a good day. Um, all these other things yeah. are just you, <laughs> you know, know ethereal it, and made up, it, and you're like, free, all of a sudden man, they're the most all, important you know, things. It's like every every time a person, because I could have done that, right? I could have been like, oh man, I'm gonna wait until January first, boom, right? But but you know what, right? You know what? No, you know what? December thirty first is. That's one of the days where a lot of people drink, and maybe I do something stupid. Maybe my life is completely different. I didn't want to be that guy anymore. Mm-hmm. Period. It didn't matter. December twenty third is just when I was like, okay, now or never, man. Line in the sand. That's what that day is, and I I stepped over the line. And that's I'm so happy I did, because if I had to say, oh, you know, I'm going to wait, you know, who knows what battles are going to break out on that side of the line if I yep. stayed, especially with, with the biggest battle coming up, the battle of New Year's Eve. And I was not I was not interested <laughs> in fighting. I, I didn't think I would have I had new soldiers on the team, man. I was like, nah, man, it's just it's not <laughs> worth it. It's not worth it. Let's get my army to safety so we can we can fight another day. <laughs> Well, the even even just becoming the person that's going to make that decision on December twenty third is a different person than the person who yeah. wouldn't. Um, so, like, you have to become that person. It's like you know, I'm going to sacrifice the next eight days or whatever because you and, know, and you know what's funny, and, right? And holidays and everything. <laughs> Does it feel like a sacrifice? Maybe at first, but now I'm like, it's so funny. You just you just look and see how your mind changes each year or even each month. And now I look and I go, man, how did I not do this sooner? Like that, that's my thought. I'm like, wow, I, I wish I, I, I had made this decision, decision sooner. But you know, uh, while I don't believe in the intervention of a higher power into mortal matters, I do think there is a course set. And if you take an opportunity that has been presented to you, then you may go down a path that you were perhaps meant to be on or that is an optimal path, but there are multiple paths available to you. Like I say, the path each person is meant to be on is the path that is right for who they are, what their what their particular gifts and talents and ways of seeing the world. I think, I think um, if we define right path in that manner, that once you get yourself under control, and you start making the correct decisions about your day-to-day living, then it puts you in a much better position to be on that path. No, I, uh, I think, I think, I think we should wrap up there. I actually, uh, like that's a good way to, that's a good, good way to cap this. But, um, I, I had, um, I put out a tweet the other day asking, um, if people had questions for you and I want to, Maybe we just uh, finish up with some um, maybe lighter stuff because oh, okay. that's a that's a good way to end the uh, motivational kick ass portion of the. Of the <laughs> Great man, hey, I, I just like I just like to get, like I said, man, break down what I learned the hard way, so you can learn it the easy way. I like that. Um, so one of the things that people kept asking about when uh, I told them I was going to interview, um, a bunch of people want to know what your process is. Um, uh, for getting good at Twitter, and this sounds, guys, if if you're you're not familiar with Ed, um, on Twitter, this sounds like I'm like making a joke or whatever. But he, I mean, you've probably gone from like eight to like thirty thousand followers in the oh, last man. year or something if like you, that. Like, I don't know, know the growth the exactly, right? Um, I'll, I'll keep it, you know, because we're wrapping up. I'll I'll keep it short. When I first. No, no, we're we're, oh, we're good. We just awesome, we just wound awesome. down the, oh, the great, super great, serious great, great. part of the time. So we when can, I first started, when I first started can, using Twitter, I had no idea what I was doing, uh, n- no clue, and I was like, oh, this is just the generic thing. I tried to pay some guy that I, but, but I didn't know anything about Twitter. I pay some guy to like run my account, and he went and put my account on this auto adder thing, and I had like I was following all mm-hmm. these people who were like follow back, follow back, follow back. It was weird. So I was like, okay, we're done with that. That's not going to work anymore. And then I went and unfollowed a whole bunch of, I mean, there are like garbage accounts that were like, literally they just, you follow them, they follow you back. And I'm like, okay, not happening. So then I was like, all right, how am I going to use this? Well, let me just use it like any other, in my mind, thank goodness, you know, like I said, everyone has their own little gifts and contributions to the world. 
I I think where I'm probably a little better than average is I can see how people are going to link and work together, i.e. like networking, reading human beings, etc. So I was like, okay, uh, th- that's all Twitter really is, this this giant connection of ideas. So let me just reach out, find the people I like to deal with and talk to, see their stuff, add some value. I mean, and, it, and it's worked. In terms of the growth, I remember last year, uh, exactly where I was. I think I was on day three of my, my vacation in Paris for the holidays, and I had crossed 10,000 followers. And I was like, oh, yay, right? 10,000. I'm going, by the end of the day, maybe today, I'll cross 30,000. So in one year, I've, I've gained, you know, 20K. And the year before that, I think I was, I think I was, I think I gained 7,500 between 2016 and 2015 Christmas. And then between 2016 and 2017 Christmas, I definitely I'm almost twenty thousand. And and the cool thing about this is it's not just like a numbers game. It's not like you're some like you know uh, crazy personality that you know put out their sex yeah. tape and <laughs> and they got super famous and it's great. But like people reading you for yes, your words, which is what I love. Um, and those and it, and it's not just like bloviating, you know, super long like. Um, they're useful insights that make you go, Oh, and I think my biggest problem is you have too many of them. (laughs) Uh, and you retweet old ones. And so then it, it, for me, I've had a, (laughs) like I told you at the beginning, I'm like, this is too much. I'm getting stuck in Twitter. I got to go do stuff, but, uh, I need to, I need to have a, a service that just serves me up like one tweet. Uh, I was thinking about making an app or something that does that maybe, but, uh, yeah, Yeah. in terms of what I do though, I mean, literally, Oh, the first part is that's just how I think and see the world, right? Every, like every, literally everything I'm tweeting are, are things I'm thinking and reflecting on or conversations I'm having. My girlfriend will say something, I'll tweet it and she'll look down five minutes later and say, Hey, how did you, when did you tweet that? Like we were having a conversation yesterday. <laughs> she said, she said, uh, she was talking about something she was doing at work and she mentioned something that just, that just popped out to me. I was like, this would be a great choice. You know, you know, too, too much talk is worse than no action. I was like, man, that's awesome, right? So I just got in and heard her say that. So it, it really is just things, for whatever reason, short, clear ways and general statements, overarching ideas, how I can fit the universe into my kind of sensibility, or rather make my sensibilities match with the universe, you find is a, is a mm-hmm. great process for thinking. And I do that with Twitter. And then when I when I hit on something or I'm just thinking about a thing or when I'm writing, a lot of times when I'm writing, I'll go through a line that I have in the in the blog and I'll pop it out on Twitter and see how it hits. I mean, I'm I'm going to use it anyway, but but I, I know it'll work well, especially you know, I used to use now I don't do it this way because you have a 280 characters. But part of promoting my blog is if if each of my sentences fits as a tweet it makes it way more likely a person will retweet the blog and then use that, that uh, line as like a lead and like, you know, here's what it says, read the, the thing. And it's working. My page views are I'm not, I'm not, I, I think, I think I'll hit, I'm on pace to have a hundred thousand page views for a, uh, for a 30 day period over the next 10 days. So, you know, that's, that's not, I don't think that's really well. I said a hundred, yeah, a hundred thousand. Yeah, I hit fifty thousand consistently, like back in December, and a lot of it is just okay. not December. Wow, it's December now. Back in September, that's what I meant to say. Uh, so, so a lot of it is just just using my mind and taking one out. How how much? Yeah, how much is it from like a um, uh, a physical perspective? And so, like a lot of a lot of the things that I'll come up with are like on long runs. Where I'm just like, actually forget a lot of like good pieces of writing that I'll like come up with or like hooks or something like that. When I'm running, I'll like come up with like 20 ideas and remember oh. like five of them <laughs> at the end of it. Um, like when I'm doing something physically hard or like I'll have like, um, like I'll say something to myself. And a lot of the times, I don't know if this happens with other writers or whatever, but a lot of the times the things that I'm writing, people will, will say something back to me and I'll be like, they be like, oh wow, that was it was like you wrote that just for me, and I'm like, that was actually for me. Like yeah. that was me. I put it on a blog. It's for a public, but that was something I needed to write myself before going to the gym today, or 
whatever it was, because um, like you just have to give yourself perspective and you bring yourself back down to reality and instead of getting stuck in your right. head. You know, um, I've I've said like working out is it it gets you familiar with your body, but then like writing stuff down to me is like exercise for your brain and it helps you like see the flaws in your own thinking and um, improves your ability to perceive kind of reality sometimes when you're like, Oh, well that's not actually how the world is right. putting it down. On paper is a, you know, it really is important to think about how you think. And a lot of people don't like to do that because well, for for starters, you might find out that the way you think about a thing is a sharp as a sharp antagonist to how you feel about a thing, and that's where it gets interesting, right? Now, now I'm the type of person the way I lead, I lead with my mind. I mean, I can consider things with my heart and my emotions and I, but I, but when I make a decision, I'm always thinking about what's optimal for the time. And, and what's good is that I can think through that. And if the emotional part is most important to me, I decide to make a decision based on that, but I never make an emotional decision. I make a mental decision that may take into account the feelings. If the feelings are like, a high priority of the the thing, you know. It's like deciding, you know. It's like it's like the decision: do I do I sit and work on this now, or do I go hang out and go take a walk with my girl? Well, maybe if I haven't seen her in two days or something like that, you know, we wouldn't. That's more important because that's really important to my relationship and my happiness. So I go do that. That makes more sense to me. I can I can rag because because that's important. I'm not doing it because like oh man I have no control over my emotions. No, I've decided and ranked out the values and priorities in my life. And if I have slipped and slacked on that one, I have to build up you know build up the the levels to to they're not critical mm -hmm. right. So so there's that. But if you don't think about how you think, you don't you won't. It's almost impossible to uncover the flaws and how you analyze a thing or, or some of the conclusions or behaviors you have and how they create an internal cognitive dissonance, which I think is one of the things that holds a lot of people back. You know, they, they feel one way, but they do another way. They act another way and think another way. Well, you're not going to uncover that in, you're not going to cover that incongruity by uh, analyzing your emotions because, because, you know, how you feel is how you feel and emotions are a different yep. thing entirely they have to be treated differently you, you don't think through them and you're not going to look at your body and go okay that was dumb because you, you, i mean you, you're that's just the vessel for getting things done it doesn't think it doesn't know i mean you can you if you really wanted to you could go run yourself till you collapse the body's not going to go hey buddy slow down no it's gonna be like all right man you said keep running i mean you know you feel this pain i'm giving you but you don't you do what you want with it <laughs> um so you have to think <laughs> you have to think through things and if you think through things you're gonna uncover you're gonna uncover biases you're gonna uncover prejudices you're gonna uncover things you're good at you're gonna uncover things you're horrible at you're gonna uncover misconceptions you uncover areas of truth that most people do not consider obvious and what you do with this information now is the fun part. But most people don't even get to the point where they're aware of themselves. What do they say? Know thyself. Part of that is knowing how you think. And this all comes back to Twitter because really, I mean, at the end of the day, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to like downplay it, but, but really I want to, I want to make it relatable though. At the end of the day, all I'm doing is tweeting my thought process and, and what I'm seeing and how I'm seeing it. And and I feel like so many people get so much from it. It really is awesome. I mean, I it, look, if everyone, for from a rarity standpoint, from a value generating standpoint, I fully, I, it'd be awesome if everyone thought like me, but if everyone thought like me, what I would do would not be interesting. You'd be like, okay, I'm not going to talk to this guy today. He's just like everyone else. But, but it's rare because a lot of people don't do it. And I think a lot of people can do it. Well, the thing that you said about uh, making like the intellectual decision, not the intellectual decision, but the uh, like the conscious decision and then um, not an emotional one. I feel like a lot of people let their emotions 
run the show. Like the motion emotions aren't just like in the car, like giving directions they are like on the wheel drunk and, you know, um, uh, pedal to the floor and they're just driving the car. And when you can separate the two and you can harness the emotion and use that emotion to be like, okay, this is going to really help me, you know, do this thing, but only after I've made the decision completely on its own. And you don't really get that without being able to think through things, um, being able to write. I, I think writing has been, you know, writing. whether it's personal or on the blog <laughs> or on Twitter, it's probably it's it's working out yes. for your brain. And there's like I the stress levels that I feel at, before and after writing, even if I'm like, I don't have anything to write about. My brain is going a million miles an hour. I can't, you know, I'm literally writing these things down <laughs> like I, I I, I can't think of anything to say um, after like if I if I sit that if I think that I'm just going to be like going through on a treadmill of stress and be like, OK, I'm stressed. So I can't write anything. So I'm not writing anything. So I'm stressed. And as soon as I write it down, it kind of breaks that cycle. And then I'm like, all right, what? Like, OK. And afterwards, there's like a, a calmness that happens and then I can actually start to make decisions. And so, um, I don't know. I mean, if people, like, if you want to get to know yourself, right. Yes. And, um, <laughs> you know, old Twitter, old Twitter is great because you'd have to be concise and now you can't yeah, kind of I, just I think, go on and on. And I sort of oh, glaze goodness. over any, you know, character. there's a way to use the 280 and there's a way to not. First of all, I don't think you should use 280. I mean, to put 280 in perspective, I write, paragraphs shorter than that on my blog and i've measured this so what are you going to do with 280 that's not the point i mean i th- i really think they gave away one of the most valuable things that the platform or valuable features that the platform had which is the conciseness like now, like, if you're wasting, like, like right, I mean, if, if you're wasting time, you're wasting time. But now you're going to waste potentially twice as much time. <laughs> so. Which is maybe one of their goals. Yeah, you know, that, so. hey, what do they say? <laughs> you know, the first hit's always free. That's what they tried to do, and that's what they did. They gave a few people a sample, and then, then they got everyone hooked. <laughs> All right, so I, uh, I want to ask you about black coffee and i got a couple of, like, i have two two questions to finish oh, with man. but um do you want to explain this for the background because literally i asked people uh <laughs> what they wanted to hear from you what, number one was twitter and number black, two was uh which, how do you like your coffee hilarious man <laughs> i'm reading it i'm like why does this keep coming up why does this keep is this a real question oh uh, right uh, so it's sort of background for anyone who doesn't know right one day I just I ha- I had a joke right, and it was a joke in my mind. May you know I've seen there's a coffee so black Twitter account. I can say I was making this joke before Twitter. I don't know if I had the joke on Twitter before they did. I'm not debating that, but but what I am just saying is where this came from for me. I said, man, coffee so black that only three fifths of its calories count. Now either you either you get that joke. Or you don't get that joke. If you get that joke, it's hilarious. If you don't get the joke, you you write me like, man, but the calories and calories are doing like 10 calorie, calories. I'm like, okay, well, I don't feel like explaining to you the three-fifths compromise or anything. You know, people, and, and, you know, uh, unrelated to coffee, I took that a step further and I said, uh, Obama is three-fifths the president that Trump is. Now, I said that knowing I said that on Twitter knowing that someone would not get it and they would light into me. And sure enough, and I said, and then I just sent them a link out of three fifths compromise. And that was the end of that. Right. Uh, So, so then I continued, I was like, man, this is just funny. And the next I said, I I think the next thing I thought of was, you know, coffee, so black white girls don't tell their fathers they drink it. And I was like, Man, this is really – and then, then people on Twitter, you know, because there's so many followers, they chime in. They, they send me some of their, their black coffee jokes. The most notable one I've read – I mean, I've read a few good ones. They're not all great. I mean, uh, the the most notable one I read, though, was uh, coffee so black that they had to make it with water from a separate fountain. And I thought, wow, that's outstanding. <laughs> 
So yeah, the whole idea is that you know you take you take Carvey so black and then you combine that with some type of black uh some type of stereotype or history or, or black history thing, right? Now the idea a great a great coffee so black joke is one that incorporates the physical the qualities of coffee without turning it into too much of a person. For example, you know, coffee so black we had to make it with different water. That focuses on the process of coffee, not like coffee so black it comes with a rap sheet and smokes Newports, which which I've heard, which is funny, right? But to me, anyhow, a better joke is one that maintains the quality of the coffee without personifying it too much, right? Uh, coffee. So, so one, <laughs> one I liked, one I liked that you had was uh, a, a combined like your your two passions, which are I don't know if this is true or not, but physics and coffee. And so it was coffee so black it right. has an event so horizon. Exactly, it doesn't like, change. That's, that's <laughs> one I can say. I can say <laughs> yeah, that that's right. Yeah, there, there's a few safe ones, yeah, and that's one of them. Uh, and uh, and by safe, I mean appropriate for all races. What it is, you know, like like they cut, they come out at the beginning of the movie. This movie is appropriate for all ages. Uh, this black coffee joke is appropriate for all races. There you go. But but yeah, uh, th- there's all kinds of ways to to do a black coffee joke. Coffee so black, this coffee so black that. But you gotta have some fun with it. And I, and I fully recognize I'm probably setting up some white guy to get his ass kicked. I get that. You know, hopefully he exercises discretion when he tells these jokes. Like, I'm the guy you can tell the joke to. And, you know, maybe your co-worker, not so much. <laughs> there you go. Don't do this and uh, don't play this over your uh, office speaker. Or like that. So, um, cool. So I, I have two big questions that um, uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, what is, uh, and then we can kind of close out, but, um, I'm always curious. People come on, they talk about like what they, what they've done, um, you know, what they're, what they're doing. Um, I'm, I'm curious what's scaring you. Like what's, uh, when you're looking at like, Oh, here, here's, you know, here's what my plan is. I'm, you know, uh, you know, uh, finishing up these semesters. Like what's, uh, yeah, you, you mentioned you're coming off the year of, uh, just getting, um, of, I think you just had your, your, your first loss, uh, like last year or something like that with boxing, You're, you took a year off, like what's scaring you these days? Um, uh, because a lot of times people like to talk about stuff in like retrospect, like, Oh, I yeah. just got through that. It was really hard. It was difficult, but now I have a story, but like now that, you know, like, what are you in right now? That's like, Oh man, you know, in terms of fear, I, I don't, Okay, I don't want to say that I am not fearful for the future. Well, no, I'm not. Because, look, I I made it through. This past year pretty much challenged me in the other way that I needed to be challenged. I didn't – it's one thing to intellectually know, okay, you're a smart guy and you have a great following and you say good things and you'll be able to profit from that one day, right? A totally different story when you have to do it. When you have to do it, when you realize it's not so hard, it doesn't come so fast, but you do it. You get through it. You learn. You learn because in my case, anyhow, I was baptized by fire. I had no choice because, look, I would have loved. I just wrote about just wrote this to my uh, to my email list and I put it on my Facebook page. I would have loved to get a job like like when I was looking for when I when I got cut. And I was going back to school. I was looking for work. I was, that's all I knew how to do is look for a job. And, and no one would hire me. Actually, that's not true. I got, I got one offer and they said, Oh, but it's at night. I came home. I told my girlfriend, I said, Hey, this hotel wants me to work on their books, but it's at night. And not since then, nor before then, has she ever said no to anything I've suggested. She may have not wanted to do it with me, but that was a thing that I was just doing. But she said no, right? And I was like, okay, you know, you, you've you earned the right to, to, to give me some, like, real, like, you can do this. Plus, I didn't really want to do it. I mean, I just didn't want to be broke. My whole mentality is that I will go to, a, I, I take care of a problem when it shows up with the best tools I have. And at that point in my life, 
mm-hmm. in January, I think this was, or December, December, a year ago. Uh, the best tool I had was, you know, going to get a job. and But no one would give me, like, any kind of internship thing because I missed the boat on that. So I went out and I... I ended up, I ended up delivering packages for Amazon for like two weeks, and that was that was horrible. And okay. then I, I I dropped off of that, and then I by by by, by happenstance, man, really crazy, you know, you know, and but also opportunity and preparation. I had started tutoring through Varsity Tutors, the site online. And they were paying eighteen bucks an hour, which is better than nothing, but the work was super inconsistent. I asked my my coach, just happened to ask me one day, hey, what are you doing for money? And I said, I'm doing this. I'm tutoring. He goes, let me talk to my wife who happens to work in a school district. And she goes, oh, well, can he tutor math and science? And I'm like, that's all I can tutor, man. (laughs) Like, so, but apparently no one else can, you know, high demand. So, so I learned that I ended up getting quite a bit of clients and I, I pray and I remember I'll never forget this. And this, this just, you know, capitalism is awesome. Right. So I got my first client. They called, they called uh, my coach's wife and said, we're really excited. We think he's going to do a great job. And I've done an outstanding job, by the way, but we think he's going to do a great job, but we're surprised at how cheap he was. I gave him my quote at $35 an hour. I said, huh, they're surprised at how cheap I <laughs> So, you know, at that point, I knew it was safe to raise prices and everything. But where am I going with this whole story between that and learning that I really enjoy teaching and tutoring and that I'm really good at it. Now I have all these referrals and I can build it. I know how to build a network within that and and the success of my writing and how that is growing. And, And I really enjoy that. And there's so many things I have planned to get done in 2018 once I'm done with my degree. Plus, I'll have my degree in physics, which means if I really need to work, I mean, how bad of a job will I get? <laughs> Be having the ability to, to crunch numbers, and I, I still like boxing. I like training. I, I'm just not, and I, and I've learned. I just had a great weekend learning uh, doing my first affiliate sale partnership with a, with a with a buddy of mine. I've been learning from a, a great mentor. I I just I don't have the fear. If you had asked me that question one year ago. The the answer would be just as long, but it would be focused on, on quite a bit, uncharacteristically of myself, quite a bit of negatives, quite a bit of things I am fearful of. But I've I made it through this year uh, wonderfully so, and I did it by confronting and moving through every single thing that I'd be afraid of in the future. Uh, like, I'm at the point, I mean, I really like Twitter and what it's doing for me, but I could lose Twitter tomorrow and and not take a hit on my income for example like someone says like someone asked a question i've seen that like you know is he worried about living better on twitter in real life i was like what a strange question let me see what i think he means That's all I want and what i think he means is that it is what we're talking about so so yeah there, there's no there's no there are no fears i really have got a lot of confidence in myself in an area where i was not where I just hadn't done anything to know if I was confident. It's not like I lack confidence or not. I just didn't know, but now I know. I know what to do. I've learned. I've learned quite a bit too between this book launch, for example, and the next. The next. Well, you know, I hope to put out three books in 2018, but I want to. But but I want to launch and do it right. I mean, I've got got a lot of backing and a much bigger network now. So, I think I think things are going to do go go great. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that was my next question is uh, what's scaring you? And then uh, 2018 going forward, a bunch of people are asking, uh, what do you got going on? You got to ah, get back into so what, uh, what are the, the ring? I've actually been writing the... this down quite a bit, skimming through and then picking like what what is most important. So so in terms of fighting in 2018, the goal is to fight twice. If I fight three times, that would be excellent. If I fight only once, I would probably have a really good reason for doing so, like, and, and not not a negative one. I mean, unless I get injured, but like, you know, I, I had this, this, and this offered, and they wanted me to be here, here, and there, and there's no way I could turn that down for that, whatever. So, so, but the but the goal is to get two fights in in 2018. In terms of writing, I have I don't I don't know if you're familiar with um. Well, well I, I won't mention it in case it doesn't fall off. It doesn't go through exactly. But a publisher approached me, and they've been, we've been working together, and we're going to – I have one book planned for sure, and I have another book planned, uh, some stuff centered around sobriety and forgiveness that is really important to me. 
and and also a course related to that. And I want to just continue to grow the blog and write. And I'll also be spending quite a bit of time at the local chess club. That's one of my 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 goals. I I had to pick between. Okay. I had to pick when I when I was selecting things to work on. And I wanted to like narrow it down to five. I was I was torn. I was like, do I want to become fluent in Spanish, or work on building my ELO rating? And I said, uh, ELO rating will probably get me closer to one of my overall much bigger goals for two to three years. So let me do that instead. And then, so the, so that's what's coming up in, in 2018. Some more books. Uh, the blog will keep growing. I'll be back in the ring training for, you know, and and I'll be doing training. Oh, there'll be, I'll be going to YouTube now with, with, with a podcast. I want to just get out there. I want another medium, another way to grow, another way, another way to deliver value. Uh, After doing all of these, these interviews and stuff, I don't think I'm too bad with my voice and delivering words in that fashion. So I'll try that out and see how it grows. Cool. Awesome! No, that's a that's a that's a good list. The uh, the chess one, you have to let me know oh, where absolutely. it goes. I'm uh, I'm terrible <laughs> at chess. So, um, but uh, maybe we uh, maybe we check back on in the uh, middle of 2018. Oh, yeah, see how sure. things are going, and uh, we do this again. This is this is awesome, man. Thanks for uh, hanging out for a bit. This is uh, I know we've been uh, kind of circling each other for a while. It's fun to oh fun yeah, to this man. Fun. This is this has been great. You know, it's funny for for a while. You know, I because I had seen you and I. You know, whenever someone has the blue check mark and they retweet me, I'm like, hey, who is this person? And I just kept looking back and forth, and I was like, oh, great. And then when you when you it's funny, uh, you know, I, I have a guy working on my website, and he really helps me. I'm my web guy, I think I wrote to you an email. He said, you know, who would be a great guy for you to for you to link up with Joel Runyon. Seems like you guys would have a lot in common and would, would you'd be a great guest and it'd be awesome for you and for him. And I said, you know, that's cool. And I was going to, that was on the 2018 list to reach out to you. And then you sent me the email and I was like, wow, man, John's got a great eye. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. So, uh, Hey, uh, where, where's the, uh, where, where's the best place for people to uh, find out more about you? If they're not already familiar, or you want to tell them, uh, best places to, uh, sync up with all your all right, stuff. So the best place, to, you know, to see, see my mom at work constantly for black coffee jokes <laughs> and life advice and all that good stuff <laughs> exactly. is Ed Lattimore, E D L A T I M O R E at Twitter, right? That's my Twitter at Ed Lattimore. My website is Ed Lattimore.com. And those are the two places you can reach me for sure. And then on Facebook, I'm, you know, I have my page at Lattimore, but, but I'm most active on my Twitter and I really do a lot of work on my website. That's where you can read the, the full length articles and sign up to the mailing list. Don't forget to sign up to the mailing list. Uh, right. so, <laughs> and you and you're, and you got to plug. The oh two yeah. Books and and the, that's right. It's funny. I just clicked on something that, that, Tommy is incredible. Oh, uh, yeah. My book, Not Caring What Other People Think is a Superpower, Insights from a Heavyweight Boxer, me being the heavyweight boxer who gives the insights. You can just find that on Amazon. You know, you look me up at Lattimore or Not Caring What Other People Think is a Superpower. Uh, that book is, you know, once again, another thing that just gave me confidence that I can make a living on my writing. So, uh, and, and on top of that, aside from the monetary aspect, because I, while I think a person should get paid for what they do, I think a person should do a good job. Uh, people really, I'm, I'm really surprised at, at some of the responses to the book, but I put a lot of heart and energy into it. So I'm, I'm happy that people are getting things from it. And the other thing, the, the other book I wrote, uh, the, the Four Confidences, which is only available Via PDF, I wanted to to sell that on my, on my own, through my own distribution network. So yeah, uh, but I have a great little video of that that that, that I didn't even do. You know, it's, it's funny. You people, you affect. You never know. And they so there's this guy Elisertis who has this great YouTube channel where he goes through all of these like the, the Napoleon on Napoleon Hill, uh, Robert Green books. The, you know, the art of power and the art of war and the art of seduction, all those. Well, he does reviews them and does his video summaries, and he signed up to my mailing list when I was giving it out for free. And he read it, and he said, this is awesome. Would you mind if I did a video summary? And I was like, would I mind? Heck, man, I, I'd pay you to do one. 
one year. I thought he just forgot about me. Uh, but one year, and then he, he came out with it, and it, it, it's awesome. And people loved it. I loved it. I was just floored just looking at it. Well, he got so much out of it. So I think anyone who downloads it will get a lot out of it too. And the four confidences, you can get that on my website. And if you want to see my sense of humor at play, also on Amazon available is How to Catch and Kill a Crackhead, The Definitive God. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, we didn't even get into your crackhead experiences. <laughs> uh, I feel like I completely failed as an Yeah, interview. you know, I grew up I grew up in the projects, man, yeah. in the ghetto with a lot of crackheads. And, and, you know, you can, what do they say? You can laugh a little or cry a lot. So I decided to make, you know, I developed a, like a, a mythology, a lore around around the crackhead and wrote a book about it. And I think it's really <laughs> funny. So that's awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll have to uh, we'll we'll save a little bit of that for next time, so we'll have some places <laughs> oh, to start. Oh, for sure, off. for sure, it'll be great. But uh, but I'll have all those links in the show notes, guys. And um, Ed, uh, thanks so much for for jumping on the call and doing this. And uh, we'll have to all do right, it again man, here soon. Thank you for having me. Hey, there we go. Episode number one is in the books. It is good to be back. I am really happy to be back on the show and back on the mic. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you like the podcast, please head over to iTunes or Google and leave us a review. It helps us reach a lot more people and challenge them to change their mindset, change their fitness, push their limits, and do something impossible. So if you got a chance, go over to iTunes, go over to Google, leave a little review. It only takes a second. And uh, if you do that, I'll take a cold shower for you, okay? Speaking of cold showers, uh, we don't do ads on the show, but... There are some tools that we have built over the past few years at Impossible that help you push your limits and do something impossible and that you can use in order to support yourself and support the show. So cold shower therapy, uh, change starts in the shower, five minutes as cold as possible every day, 30 days. Uh, You can time yourself. uh, We've actually built an app for this to help you do this and take away every excuse that you have. Uh, The app lets you time yourself. You can put on your favorite pump-up song, and you can see if you can beat the current record, which is at 1,229 showers in a row. Some people are crazy, okay? So it's a there's a free mindset course at coldshowertherapy.com. You can get the app on iTunes or Google Play. Uh, they're actually both free. So um, if you're looking for a way to challenge yourself mentally and physically with the cold, cold shower therapy is a great way to do that. Uh, the second thing is movewellapp.com. If you're an athlete who wants to get stronger or recover from an injury faster, or you're a desk jockey who get aches and pains from sitting down all day, you're going to want to check out MoveWell. I built this app to help you move better as an athlete, get stronger, and recover faster, as well as have less pain. Instead of dealing with stupid pills or things that don't work, we built an app that's a personal mobility coach that you can use anywhere, anytime, in less than 15 minutes. Some of you guys know this story. I built this app after hurting my ankle running an ultra marathon in Patagonia. I needed to do about six months of rehab work, but I hated doing it on my own. And so that's what we built MoveWell for. It's the mobility coach when you can't go into rehab, can't afford rehab, and don't want to just deal with pills or surgery or crap like that. It's a personal mobility coach you can take with you anywhere on your phone. MoveWellApp.com. It's free to try out. It hurts so good. All right, so that's the show. I will see you guys on the next one. Till next time, boom.